Right. Hello. Welcome to the second lecture on web services. Today, we'll have two main topics. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the web service architecture, uh, which deals mainly with uh, terms and their relations um, in terms of web services. So what terms are there, what they mean, and how they are related to each other so that later we can use those terms to talk about the technologies that are actually involved in uh, implementing web services. And the second part will be uh, an introduction to our first real web service technology, and that will be SOAP, um, which you will then uh, try again yourself on uh, the next tutorial. Before we get to the actual architecture, uh, we need to talk a little bit how the authors of the web services stack, and now I'm talking about the W3C style web services. So the web services based on the specification uh, by the World Wide Web Consortium, how the authors imagined that the web services actually will interact, because that might be a little bit maybe surprising or unintuitive because the first step here is actually that uh, the two people or the organization that um, are going to use web services to communicate first need to get to know each other. Um, so um, there is no, uh, or the primary use case of W3C style web services is not uh, auto discovery of web services. The primary use case is that uh, you know about the web service that you want to use and uh, you get to know it, you get the specification of the web service and the uh, description of what it should do and only then you start using it. So uh, it is assumed that you actually know who runs the web service, why, um, that uh, you know that you can use the web service and you know what the web service is about, what it does, uh, before you actually start using it. So that's step one. <clears throat> the two parties get to know each other, or at least the user or the potential client gets to know the web service, the server that uh, they are going to use. It is not uh, necessary that uh, the uh, provider of the web service actually knows all their clients, but uh, the client needs to know um, the, the provider. Um, and the client here is called a requester. So uh, the requester gets to know the provider first. Then they agree on the semantics and the web service description. Uh, the web service description contains several technical artifacts, such as um, the description of the interfaces, and uh, the operations and the messages, how to technically use the web service. And the semantics is typically a human readable document which describes what actually uh, the web service does in a human readable language. Um, and both parties then use the semantics and the descriptions to actually implement, um, well, the server and the client, the, the web services, and then they interact. So um, it is, yeah, again, not aimed at uh, auto discovery as a primary, primary use case. And uh, this assumption then has some effects. So um, always remember that we can assume that you first have the time to get to know the, the uh, provider and their web services, and then you are expected to start using them. Right. So let's have a look at the web services architecture. Uh, it is actually for simplicity split into four main views. So it is one architecture, but it is split into four views, which are focused on various parts of uh, the architecture or explain the architecture from various points of view. Uh, there is a message oriented model focused on messages and how uh, they fit into the web services landscape. Then policies, rules, how to behave, how to use the web services and so on. Then resource oriented model, which has to do with the resources and their representations and identification and so on. Uh, 
Uh, and then finally, there is a service oriented model, which focuses on the services themselves. And now we'll have a look at those four parts or four points of view uh, on the web service architecture. And uh, we'll always have a simplified view to get the feeling of what that view is about. And then the full view as specified in the web services architecture document, which you can uh, of course see here uh, linked. And uh, I suggest you take a look at uh, how it looks like because it explains the architecture and all the terms in much greater detail than I will talk about them here. So let's start with a simplified uh, view of the message oriented model. So in the center here, of course, is the message. The message is what is being sent among the web services. And uh, here we have uh, another term agent. The agent here is the software that is uh, used to actually create or receive the messages, the software implementing the web service. So a message originates in one agent and uh, is processed by another agent. So those are the implementations of the web services. Now, the message contains some application uh, data. So that is the core of what you want to actually exchange, some application specific data. But this data needs to get from one agent to another. And there are many ways uh, of uh, how that can be done. So those are message transports. We already know about HTTP as one of the message transports, but you can imagine also SMTP. So you can successfully build a web service based on email exchange because um, all that is necessary is that a message gets from one agent to another and email can accomplish that as well as HTTP. And there are also other options. So that's message transport. And then each message as today, I'll repeat many times, has a header and a body. So the body is the core data and uh, the headers contain some metadata. So this is a simplified view and the detailed view is not that much uh, more detailed. So here uh, we can actually see the message in the center of course, and the message has a sender and a receiver, both of uh, which are agents. So that's, that part should be clear. Now the receiver has an address, of course, because we need to send the message somewhere to be received. And uh, the address is known by message transport. So in case of emails, it will be the email address. In, a, in the case of HTTP, it will be the URI and so on. Uh, and the message transport delivers the message. So that's this part. Uh, now a message has headers and body, and both of those are encapsulated in an envelope. Again, this is uh, basically uh, the description of the SOAP protocol that we will talk about uh, today a little bit uh, in a more technical detail. But yeah, message has an envelope and it has a body and headers. Um, now, SOAP, uh, as again, we will talk about today, uh, is used for sending a message from one agent to another, and that's it. Uh, but if you remember, in the, in the end of the last lecture, I showed you some common communication patterns. And uh, there was the uh, request response pattern, uh, or there was a sub uh, publish subscribe pattern and so on. And all those patterns actually involve a communication um, using multiple messages. And uh, those communication patterns in terms of messages are called message exchange patterns. So if uh, we are talking about a request response message exchange pattern, then this one involves two messages. So this particular uh, message exchange pattern is a set of two messages. Uh, and the correlation is that one message is a response to another message. So that is this part. And um, yeah, here we talk about policies and uh, message reliability is one of those policies, but uh, we will talk about policy in another uh, or actually in the next um, web services architecture view. So that was, uh, uh, that was messages. And uh, now policies. So policies are basically sets of rules saying what you can do um, or under which condition you can do certain actions. Um, 
or uh, they say uh, that if you do some action, you also need to do another action. So that's obligation. So the, the first one is permission. The second one is obligation. And um, policies are sets of such rules. So the policies are established by people or organizations, of course. Someone decides, okay, to use this web service, you need to be authenticated. That's a policy established by the owner of, uh, of some uh, web service, for instance, in a form of a policy. The policy is about an action. So to read something, you need to be authenticated. To write something, you need to be authenticated. So read and write is the action. Um, the requirement to be authenticated is the policy. Uh, and agent is subject to the policy. So agent, again, is the software is subject to the policy means that the agent needs to ensure that they are authenticated so that they can um, perform some action. Now, this is just one example of a particular policy. There are many other kinds of policies. And the policies are about resources, where web services are kinds of resources. So um, yeah, so the policy says, if you want to access this, um, and you want to read this, um, then the person running the service says the agent needs to be authenticated. So this is a simplified view. The full view looks like this. It is uh, a bit more detailed than before with the messages. So here we have the policy, which um, is, um, uh, well, which is either a permission or an obligation. So permission to do something, obligation to do something. Now, um, the policy constrains the agents, the software and the pieces of software. Um, the pieces of software are owned by a person or uh, an organization as well as resources. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the permission, yeah, the agent requires permission to access some web service or, um, okay, yeah. That's it. And uh, then we have the resources. They are controlled by permission guards. Permission guard is something that checks the permission of an agent. And if the agent has the permission, then yes, they, they have access to the resource. And uh, obligations are checked by audit guards, uh, which monitor resources and make sure that uh, the obligations are met. Uh, so yeah, this is the policy oriented model. And the third one is a resource oriented model. So in the center of this view is a resource. And again, remember that the service is one kind of a resource. And again, the resource is owned by someone. Um, now you can imagine the resource as uh, for instance, a timetable at your doctor's. So you want to read your doctor's timetable. Okay, so your doctor, actually owns that resource. Um, the resource may have representation. So the timetable as such is an abstract entity, but you can see your doctor's timetable in HTML. So that's one representation. Or you may want to see the timetable in uh, JSON because you want to process it in a machine readable way. So that's another representation of the same resource. Uh, <clears throat> now a web service is a resource because Again, it can be described, identified, and so on. And speaking of identification, a resource has an identifier. And because we are talking about web services, those identifiers will always be URIs or IRIs, uh, depending on uh, whether or not we are talking about an international environment. Uh, a slightly more detailed view here. So resource has an identifier, may have some representations, is owned by a person or organization. They also establish policies. We talked about those in the last uh, view. So policies which apply to resources and resources have descriptions. Um, so uh, a resource description may be an entry in a data catalog. For instance, if the resource is a data set in a data catalog, the description is the record in the data catalog. The description is indexed by a discovery service. So that may be again, a catalog. Um, as we will see later in the course, one of uh, the technologies um, in uh, W3C style web services is all about finding services and uh, making catalogs of services. So we'll see such a discovery service. 
that discovery service is also a service because it can be used in a well by by, by agents by software to find other services and uh, then uh, agent which is a software discovers resources in a uh, discovery service so that's a resource point of view so resources have ids have representations and this brings us to the fourth and final view of um, the web services architecture and that's the service oriented model so here in the center we have the service which is the web service that we interact with again the service is owned by a person or an organization and uh, an agent which is again software either uses the service or realizes the service depending on whether the agent is a client or a server and uh, the service is described by metadata and the service is signaled by messages because as we already know we interact with web services by sending messages so this one is a bit more complex uh, so um, the service is in the middle and uh, the service is provided or requested by an agent so this is software uh, the service and the agent is owned by a person or organization um, the service performs service task which achieves a goal state so um, a user of the web service wants to achieve something that's a goal state and they want to achieve it using service tasks um, the service has a description uh, which describes the interface that's the technical part and the semantics that's the human readable part uh, semantics talks about the service tasks now uh, service task executes an action such as read or write or something else um, and the action processes or results in messages because you request an action using a message and it results in another message being returned um, the the action results ideally in the, in the goal state so you achieve your goal uh, using those messages now messages can be part of choreography which is basically uh, a high level um, view of uh, which service sends uh, messages to which service and so on uh, or which task uh, produces messages for for which and uh, which other task and so on to achieve the goal so you may combine those uh, into a choreography uh, yeah so that's the service oriented model so that's uh, basically what the web service uh, web services architecture is about about those basic terms and their relations and if you take a look at uh, actually uh, the links i uh, included here in the slides you will see the entire document with uh, with the precise descriptions of all those uh, all those terms but it is just so um, if you come across those terms in specifications especially w3c star specifications you know that those correspond to actually the ones in this document and that there are definitions of those terms um, written here um, right so that was uh, the architecture now let's have a look at a, an example of a uh, web service or a set of web services so um, the example here is from the travel domain so imagine um, your airlines or having web services for um, ticket booking and, and your travel agent having a web service for booking the entire uh, vacation for instance communicating with hotels and airlines um, to actually book your whole itinerary for instance so that is an ecosystem of web services each one can be implemented as a web service which has some uh, some uh, advantages and uh, the properties of those applications which can be implemented as web services have something in common uh, one example of an application that is um, good to have implemented as a web service is actually a wrapper of a legacy application so if you have an application that was created for instance before the internet uh, or before at least the web um, so again in a bank or in e-government or something something very old but essential 
and now you uh, you want to communicate with that application well at all so uh, uh, but uh, um, you actually want to communicate with it over the internet but um, there may be other challenges as well even though um, if uh, even in the case the application is actually not accessible through the internet still there may be some interoperability issues because of the hardware used and the operating system used and so on so those like legacy applications, if they are to be accessed in a modern way or accessed using the internet and web, that's a good candidate for implementation using a web service because you can wrap the legacy application uh, as a web service and therefore making it interoperable in, uh, in today's environments. Um, the application might not even know about the existence of a web or a network uh, and this can be shielded from it, again, using the uh, web services stack as a wrapper. Uh, now, another, uh, another example of when web services should be used is when you have a complex system of functionalities and um, they can be evolved all at the same time. They need to be split into uh, smaller functionalities which can evolve uh, one at a time. So that's, again, a good use case for web services. And it has to do with the service-oriented architecture that I talked about, talked about briefly in the previous lecture. Now, another use case for web services is when um, the individual parts of the functionality run on completely different platforms. Then again, each of those parts can be wrapped as a web service, abstracting from all the differences leaving those to the implementation, which is hidden from the user and therefore making those uh, interoperable on the, on the web. And of course, uh, when you need to ensure scalability, because if you have your web service implemented right, which means it is self-contained, doesn't need to interact with uh, other web services or other things to perform its task, then you can scale it quite easily because if you run into like performance problems, you can spin up or deploy another copy of the same web service and use that as well. And since they are self-contained, they should scale quite well. Uh, you can ensure security and so on. Uh, so those are all use cases in which web services are uh, a good fit. And uh, the advantages are the platform independence because uh, the specifications, as they are written, they are really platform independent. They can be implemented on any platform, abstracting from the details of the platform. Uh, the web services are reusable because if you take, for, uh, for instance, this one, so Turkish Airlines booking web service, you can use that in a business process of a travel agency or a uh, airline ticket booking website or another business process because it is, again, quite uh, self-contained. It focuses on one task uh, and does it well and can be used in many different scenarios and business processes. So those are reusable. They are interoperable because they all use the same specifications, um, such as SOAP, we'll talk about SOAP today, um, but also other specifications established by the W3C consortium. Uh, therefore, all those services, when they uh, use those specifications or comply with them, they are interoperable. They are scalable, I talked about that one, and adaptable, meaning that uh, they have some defined interface, and when the implementation needs to change, it can change while maintaining that interface, and therefore nothing really breaks. Right, so those are some um, generic advantages of, uh, of web services. And now, uh, let's move uh, a little bit closer to technologies. So this is the W3C style web services stack. Um, I emphasize again, the W3C style web services stack because uh, we are also talk about RESTful web services, which have another stack of technologies. Um, but we'll start this course with the W3C style web services. Now you can find those in environments which uh, need a strong backing in specifications, uh, which you won't find in RESTful web services. So if you need like um, really strong compliance 
with specifications, um, you go to W3C style web services. Uh, those environments include government or enterprise uh, environments where you really need to depend on uh, proper implementation according to specifications. Now, uh, uh, W3C style web services is a whole family. Uh, it's a large family of uh, specifications actually, focusing on different parts of uh, functionalities that may be required uh, when implementing web services. And we'll, uh, or I will introduce you to some basic ones and then I will show you what other extensions uh, can be there, some examples, but uh, know that uh, there are many, many more uh, for other functionalities that I will not talk about. Um, so let's talk a bit about the stack. So at the bottom, we have the message transfer protocols, the communication. So we talked about HTTP, SMTP, and there can be some Java messaging and so on. So any message, any, protocol that allows you to send message from one application to another is usable uh, within this stack. On top of this protocol, uh, there is a, uh, well, another layer of a message uh, transfer protocol, and that is uh, actually SOAP, which we'll talk about in a bit. We are getting closer. Uh, so SOAP uh, deals with actually encapsulating application data uh, which needs to be exchanged with another application and sending it via uh, one of the communication or message transfer protocols. Um, so that's sending messages. That's what SOAP is for. And SOAP is an XML format. Actually, WSGL is also an XML format. And many of those, uh, those extensions, maybe all of those, are based on XML and XML schema. That is why we practice that a little bit uh, last time in the tutorials. Uh, right, so that's messaging. Now, uh, let's go one level up and let's talk about the contract. We already know that the contract in terms of web services is uh, the description of the web service interface. Uh, and for that, we have the WSGL language, which we will talk about next lecture and uh, the tutorial after the next one. Um, then uh, part of the contract may be a set of policies. Um, WS policy here is actually uh, one of those SOAP extensions here. Um, and it is a framework for expressing policies that need to be met when communicating with W3C, uh, W3C style web services. Um, so yeah, we'll see this one uh, in this course as well. And when you have your web services described, your interfaces and you know how they should exchange messages uh, via which protocols and so on, you can compose those messages into uh, larger processes. Uh, one of such, uh, uh, that's called an or orchestration. And uh, one of those orchestration languages is Beeple, Business Process Execution Language. Uh, we will talk about Beeple and uh, there will be a tutorial on Beeple so you will get to uh, know Beeple quite well. Uh, then there is a message for choreography, um, but we won't be talking uh, about this one uh, in this course. So that's uh, out of scope for us. Uh, one thing that, uh, uh, for instance, people uses is XSLT. That's also why we actually uh, reviewed XSLT a little bit last time. Right, um, so that's an uh, overview of uh, what, what is ahead. And uh, if we take a closer look uh, at what is going on between a web service client and a web service well, server, um, this is what we see. The web service itself has an interface described by, by WSGL. We'll talk about WSGL the next time. And uh, then the client and the server exchange messages and they do it using SOAP. And, uh, that brings us to the second part of today's lecture, and that is introduction to SOAP. Uh, SOAP stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. It is a uh, web standard because it is a W3C style, uh, sorry, W3C specification recommendation. So it is a web standard for exchanging messages among uh, web services. 
Uh, now, the uh, or unfortunately, quite an important uh, fact is that there are currently two widely spread versions of SOAP. 1.1, which is from 2000, and it is just a note, so it is not a standard. And then there is 1.2, which is the actual web standard. However, both of those versions are used uh, up to uh, today. So typically, when uh, you are talking about WSBC Star Web Services, you need to know both versions of SOAP. And they, in SOAP, they differ quite um, uh, slightly. So there is not much in terms of function. Uh, there is uh, a couple of differences, like uh, different element names and so on. We'll get to that. So this is so that you are not confused later. There are two versions, 1.1, 1.2. Um, right. SOAP is a protocol for inter-application communication. That means that you have two applications, like uh, one in Java, one in C Sharp, for instance, and they want to communicate. So they want to exchange uh, data, they want to do RPC, remote procedure call, and so on. And they can use SOAP and the uh, web services stack to do that. Um, and uh, from the point of view of the application, they uh, really have their data, such as uh, the uh, objects in their object uh, model, and they want to send that object to another application running somewhere else. Um, and it can be done using SOAP libraries so that uh, actually the developer of the application knows nothing about SOAP. Uh, so they just call a method and uh, the method returns and the exchange is realized using SOAP and HTTP and so on, but that uh, can remain hidden from, uh, from the actual developer. And we'll see that in uh, today's um, tutorial, I think. Now, I already talked about SOAP being a standard for uh, communication with web services. Uh, it is extensible, and we'll talk about that later because you can add SOAP headers to add actual functionality to your message exchange. Um, it uh, increases interoperability because uh, when you implement SOAP, uh, it, that doesn't matter to your clients uh, on which platform you run your server and so on. Um, it is quite lightweight. It's a simple specification. It doesn't need any special functionality or environment. It is basically an XML language. So uh, an XML format with some functionality required, but that can be implemented using a simple library. So it is quite lightweight. Now, the title itself, Simple Object Access Protocol, is a bit misleading because SOAP, in fact, is not that simple. And also, it is not just an object access protocol. That's why in SOAP 1.2, SOAP is no longer considered an acronym for simple object access protocol. It is just SOAP. Um, so uh, that's just a fun fact um, that uh, during the standardization of SOAP, they uh, realized that it is actually not simple. Yep. So uh, let's continue. So SOAP is, uh, is stateless. That's similar to HTTP. We talked about it last time, what it means to be stateless. It means that the server doesn't keep any state or the in, uh, information needed to process a message needs to be included in that message because the server has no other means of getting additional data. Um, and what is important is that SOAP implements a one-way message exchange pattern, which means that SOAP itself focuses on sending the message and uh, that's it, nothing, nothing else. If you want to implement another message exchange pattern, such as request response or publish subscribe or something like that, you need to do that outside of SOAP using another technology such as Whistle, where you can define that your operation uses certain message exchange pattern. And then each of those messages is one SOAP uh, exchange, but uh, from the SOAP point of view, that's it, just the one message exchange. Um, right, as I mentioned, SOAP is an XML document uh, and it is transferred, the SOAP message is transferred over network via HTTP, SMTP, and so on. How it looks like actually when you use SOAP is that 
you have your sender and your receiver. Those are agents, those, those are your applications. They have some data they want to send over the network. What SOAP does is that it encapsulates that data into a so-called SOAP message. And then a particle message transfer protocol then sends the SOAP message over the network to the receiver. So when you are talking about SOAP messages themselves, you don't actually have to deal with what kind of message transfer protocol is being used because that's one level down. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll talk about that also a bit, uh, a bit later. Now let's get to the syntax of a SOAP message. A SOAP message has uh, an envelope. That's a root of the XML uh, document. And the envelope always has a body with the application data, and it may have um, a header. And within that header, they may be multiple header blocks. Uh, within body, there may be also multiple body entries. So that, that's basically it, very simple. That's the SOAP um, um, message right there. So an envelope with a body, with some entries, and maybe a header with some header blocks. Uh, now, in XML, it looks just like this. So we have the XML root, we have the envelope. Now, important part here is um, the namespace, because the namespace here determines whether you are using SOAP 1.1 or 1.2. In this case, you can see that the namespace is from the W3 uh, domain, so that's the standardized version, and that's SOAP 1.2. Uh, so the envelope element here is from this uh, namespace, and so is the header and the body here. So this is the high-level overview of a SOAP message. Again, you will need this for the tutorial uh, tomorrow. And this is a part of a real SOAP message filled with data. Uh, what we can see here is that the SOAP namespace here is the non-standard one from schemas xmlsoap.org that's soap 1.1 so this is the other version but as you can see here the element names the local ones are the same we have the envelope we have the header we have the body in the header we have header blocks this requester credentials element whatever it is it is one header block and there may be multiple header blocks and in the body we see some xml data being transferred it doesn't matter really what it is. This is some uh, legacy PayPal API uh, for sending some money to, to, to someone. Um, so let's focus a little bit on the header. So header, it doesn't have to be there. It is optional in SOAP, but here it is there and it contains one header block. In this case, that's the requester credentials. Now, uh, each header block should have its own namespace. Um, or at least um, header box defined by a single specification or a single application should belong to their own XML namespace, so that that namespace can be uh, can be the thing that determines which application then should process actually that particular header block. There can be multiple header blocks in one uh, SOAP header. Um, those header blocks. Uh, uh, in, uh, or contain typically information that is not uh, directly related to application data because that one is in, in body, but it may contain things like authentication, which is uh, this case. So if you send a SOAP message to another application and uh, on the SOAP level, you say maybe by some web services policy that um, with that application, you can only communicate when you're authenticated. The authentication part, has really nothing to do with the application data. So the authentication part is dealt with in the header block and um, in the data, you have just the payment information. Um, right, also the header blocks represent the extensibility of SOAP because you can really insert any header block you want uh, into the SOAP header. Uh, and by that, you can add functionality without actually changing the application data. So that's um, uh, right. And, uh, and those um, extensions are sometimes called SOAP modules. So if you see SOAP modules somewhere, 
And that usually means that they define some header blocks to be used um, along with some use case. Um, right, we talked about authentication and the header blocks can be used for encryption, which we'll see in one of the later uh, lectures. Uh, and uh, an interesting fact, uh, the specifications for W3C style web services are not necessarily all created by W3C. And there is also another organization called Oasis, which uh, develops a lot of W3C style web services specifications. Um, and uh, for instance, the one I mentioned for the catalogs of web services is also developed by Oasis. That is UDDI, again, one of the topics of, uh, of um, one of the next lectures. Right, with the body, it is quite simple. Each, uh, each block in the body contains some application specific data. And that is the data that gets later, for instance, unserialized um, as a method return value in some application code. So this is, yeah, this is the actual, uh, actual data being transferred from one application to another. Right, so that's quite simple. Now you already should be able to basically write your own SOAP message because you know about the envelope, the headers and the body and the namespaces and the relation to, to version of SOAP. So if I tell you create a SOAP message in SOAP 1.2, um, you already know how to do that. Um, and you are able to send it somewhere because I can also tell you the endpoint where you should send that message. Uh, if you are actually sending a SOAP message with a uh, actual SOAP content, then you always use HTTP uh, and you do that using HTTP, then you use the HTTP post method to do that. Uh, that's um, the standard method in HTTP to actually send some data. So to send your post, uh, your SOAP message, you use HTTP post and the endpoint URL, and that's it. Um, if everything goes well, you get another SOAP message as a response. Uh, and um, that is already a message exchange pattern, the request response one. The question is what happens if there is a problem and uh, SOAP has actually a standardized answer to that and that is called a SOAP fault. There are various kinds of faults or errors that can happen when you actually send a message to someone else. Um, there can be an error on the network transfer protocol level. So for instance, um, URI does not exist or something then you get an error um, using your chosen network um, transfer protocol. So you get uh, HTTP 500 or 404 or something like that. Um, so that has yet nothing to do with SOAP. However, if the uh, network transfer protocol actually relays the message to uh, another agent and the message gets to the SOAP processing part of that agent, then when something goes wrong, such as incorrect syntax of SOAP, incorrect version of SOAP, uh, or some other uh, error in um, the format of the SOAP message, you get a SOAP specific fault as a, uh, as a response. And if everything is okay on the SOAP level, then the data gets uh, passed to the receiving application. And if there something goes wrong, you get an application specific fault. But both of those, the SOAP specific fault and the application specific fault are standardized by SOAP as a fault message. Um, each fault message has a code, which I'll show you next, and a reason, uh, which is a human readable text uh, for the developer to know what actually went wrong. Um, one of the common um, fault codes is version mismatch, which happens when you communicate a SOAP 1.1 message to a SOAP 1.2 endpoint, for instance. Um, another quite common one, and I think you will see this one uh, when playing with SOAP uh, on the tutorial, is a sender code, which means you as a sender did something wrong with the SOAP message and you should correct it. And there are other, uh, such as your receiver, 
which means that the message couldn't be processed and other uh, other codes that I will explain in another lecture. And uh, the, um, the introduction to SOAP is only the first part um, where we all talk about SOAP. Then we will switch to Whistle for a bit on the next lecture. And then we'll get back to SOAP with some details, including faults and um, the, the such, well, the faults like must understand, which has to do with um, SOAP intermediaries and so on. So there is a bit advanced stuff. Um, so don't worry about that right now. Uh, worry about that later. Uh, some examples of SOAP faults. So this, this one is the version mismatch fault. Um, so you can see that you get a SOAP envelope. Um, in the body, there is the fault element with the code uh, version mismatch. And notice that all those um, elements and even the code are from the SOAP uh, namespace. In this case, it's the SOAP 1.2 namespace. And in the header, you might get a hint about what you should do. And this actually says, okay, you should upgrade to um, envelope from this namespace, which is SOAP 1.2. So this fault you get when you send a SOAP 1.1 message to a SOAP 1.2 endpoint. This is an example of the must understand um, fault, which uh, you might not understand now. Uh, for that, you'll need what's in the lecture uh, in two weeks. But let's say that with each header block, you are able to say whether the receiver should or should not understand that particular block. Uh, there may be multiple header blocks from multiple applications in one message. And not all of those header blocks need to be understood by the receiver. But some of them can be marked as mandatory to be understood. And if they are not, then this fault is returned, identifying the header blocks which were not understood. Um, right, I already talked about the reason, which is the human readable text in the body of the fault explaining what happened, and this one is actually also mandatory. So you should always get a code and a reason. Right, so that will be enough for us to play with SOAP in the tutorial. Uh, let me finish with a uh, brief overview of the differences between SOAP 1.1 and 1.2. Uh, so, the one obvious difference is in the namespace of all those elements. So SOAP 1.1 is the non-standard non-W3C1, and SOAP 1.2 is the one starting with W3.org. That's how you can tell the difference. Another um, difference is in the expected content type. With SOAP 1.1, the expected content type of the SOAP messages uh, is text XML. Um, this might already by itself cause some problems because nowadays another XML content type is widely used and that is application slash XML. The difference is that if your content type starts with text, it can be viewed by people or it's saying that it can be viewed by people. When it uh, states application, it means that it is an application specific file not meant to be viewed by people. And um, some of the tools that work with uh, web services, HTTP and so on, automatically fill application slash XML when they know that you are working with XML, which will cause you problems when communicating with SOAP 1.1 endpoints because they require text slash XML, which is a different content type. And with SOAP 1.2, there is a special content type for SOAP. So that's application slash SOAP plus XML, meaning it is serialized in XML. Another difference uh, is regarding a so-called SOAP action. Now, SOAP action is a small piece of metadata which tells uh, the HTTP protocol or the application working at the HTTP level something about what the message in SOAP is about. Um, first, let's have a look at how it looks like, and then uh, I will talk a little bit more about why uh, this exists. So the SOAP action is a URI value, 
uh, identifying the intent of the message or some purpose of the message. Um, it is not a standardized list. It is application specific. So uh, if we are talking about uh, doctor schedules, uh, this soap action may identify, I want to make an appointment or something like that. Um, it will still be an IRI. With SOAP 1.1, there is the content type header saying it's text, uh, text XML, that's quite clear. And then there is another header SOAP action with the URI identifying what the message should uh, do. Now, why do we need something like this? Before I get to the difference to 1.2, why do we need something like SOAP action here? Any ideas? It has to do with the network stack and the layering of the protocols. Um, when we are talking about SOAP messages, we have SOAP headers, which may contain some application specific metadata. We have the, uh, the, the data in the SOAP message, and all this is serialized as an XML document. This XML document is then sent for instance, using HTTP over the network, right? But this means that all the network um, appliances on, uh, on, the, on the way from the client to the server, they see the message as a regular uh, HTTP message with somebody, nothing more. But if they were to treat each message differently based on something, they cannot because they would have to decode what is in the HTTP body, then they would need to parse the XML document, then they would need to know SOAP to, to read the headers, and then they could decide to treat uh, one message differently to another, for instance, for quality of service purposes or uh, something else, uh, which, which would make the uh, appliances, and we are talking about switches and uh, uh, firewalls and all, all those network uh, items on the way, uh, it would make them, uh, um, well, more complex, and it would break the layering of the network stack because they would actually have to go to the application layer and they have no business going there when they are uh, working with HTTP. That is why there is this uh, option, or actually it is almost mandatory, I think, um, to, include a little piece of metadata into the HTTP headers uh, so that all uh, those firewalls and, and switches and all this uh, who under just on this SOAP action, what to do with the message without actually knowing XML and SOAP. So that is why we have SOAP action here. We can use that to actually treat different messages um, differently uh, or to know something about the message on the level of HTTP without actually parsing the SOAP message. And there is a difference in SOAP 1.2. This SOAP action is actually part of the content type header. So the content type value actually can have uh, multiple values in it uh, separated by semicolons. One is the content type itself. Then it's uh, the characters that are used in this case, UTF-8, and then there can be action and uh, some URI, and that is the SOAP action. So with 1.2, this is part of the content type. In 1.1, it was a separate uh, HTTP header. Yep, and uh, there are um, differences in, um, in um, element names, but uh, we will talk about those elements um, in the next lecture. Just know that there are differences in element names and maybe data types here must understand saying that uh, a header must be understand by a SOAP node is one or zero in the standardized version is true, false, and so on. So I will talk about this later. And uh, even with false, which we talked about today, there is a difference with 1.2, you get the code and reason element with 1.1, you get false code and false string element. So it is the same thing, but it's named differently. And uh, you can try it uh, yourself uh, on the tutorial later. So that's it from, from today. Any questions?